All right. Uh, welcome back to the AP Podcast. I'm your host, Archer Heron, with Hayden Green. Today, we are joined by Brayden with another episode. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the bubble and what questions we have for each team. We're actually going to go through alphabetically, uh, starting with the Celtics, and just go down and kind of give uh, one question or thought we have on each team. There's definitely a lot of questions in the air right now uh, in regards to what's even going to happen. I mean, the cases are going up. Who knows what's going to happen? But as long as uh, we get some NBA basketball, I'm I'm a happy guy. But, um, yeah, if we want to go ahead and start off with the Celtics, um, Beach, go ahead. Do you have uh, anything you Actually, before – I hate to do this, but before, um, I kind of just want to say, like, kind of how I structured mine because obviously the biggest question for these teams is can they win a series or can they win a championship but for this list um, hopefully we all did it the same way but we just we just made these questions marks these question marks um, like more specific and more addressable um, so yeah like without further ado let's just get into it with the Boston Celtics um, so what my my biggest question mark for them is can Jason Tatum be the best player on a championship team um, back in the 2017-18 season, obviously we saw we got a little taste of that uh, when Kyrie was out. We saw what Tatum could do as the number one guy. Uh, they made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. They took LeBron James to seven games. Um, but last year with Kyrie, they lost in five to Milwaukee in the second round. Um, but this year with Tatum, especially towards the end of the season, the Celtics were on a tear. And now that it's Jason Tatum's team, and given the fact that he has two more years under his belt since 2017, I think that the Celtics can for sure make some noise, but I just don't really – I'm not really sold on them as, like, a finals favorite. There are some other teams that I want to get into a little later that I think have a, a much better chance. But uh, what did you guys say for Boston? Yeah, uh, go ahead, I agree then. with that. Uh, but my question was more so – I guess it was – I feel like Tatum in the future could be that guy. So mine was more based on, like, what they could do this year. I feel like their one big hole is kind of their lack of depth off the bench. They have a great starting lineup, minus tights. I would say one of the most like well-rounded starting lineups in the league outside of tights, of course. Daniel Tice, he's but not like bad, I mean. he's not bad, but like he's not exactly to all those other guys. Yeah. That's fair. I, like, I feel like it would be a very well-rounded. It, it's a great starting five, um, mm-hmm. but their lack of depth could be a big issue. I feel like honestly, the bubble. And, like, that break kind of helped them. Yeah. You know, like a lot of these guys might have some more gas in the tank. Um, I would just say, you know, if it comes down to an injury or two, will some of those guys be able to step up? I really like Marcus Smart off the bench, but after that it gets kind of sparse. Um, yeah. Um, that was my big point. One thing I want to say about depth, especially um, now in these times um, with the coronavirus and players that, like, a potential, like, positive mm-hmm. test – Um, In the past, we've seen that depth has not really mattered in the playoffs, but now it seems like um, COVID-19, all that potential stuff, and plus the three months of rust you're having to get off, that depth could be a lot more important. And then um, for the Celtics, like you said, it's like Marcus Smart off the bench, and then maybe Ines Kanter is not bad. And then after that, it's just really a lot of – then you get into like the Brad Wanamaker, Javante. So the July. Yeah. So that's, I think that's also a good question to have. But. Yeah. Uh, for the Celtics, for me, I mean, Jason Tatum, I'm not going to question his talent level. Like he can obviously do it. And we've seen in the past, he has performed really well in the playoffs. But uh, I just kind of want to, he was producing some crazy numbers at the end of the season. Like, like averaging 30 for the last like 10 or 15 games. He dropped 39 in the Clippers, 41 on the Lakers. I mean, two of probably the biggest uh, championship favorites in the league right now, and he was dropping 40 on them. Uh, I just – I don't question – I just kind of wonder if he can give the give us that same kind of, like, efficiency. And I don't think he can produce those same numbers. We'll see. But uh, depending on the depth that the Celtics have and how much they really need him to step up in that leading role – because, I mean, Kimba Walker also. I mean, I see him as one of the better leaders in the league. So – I don't know. It's going to be really uh, cool to see if Jason Tatum can kind of stitch together something great. You know, I I do think the Celtics can make it to the finals. Yeah, I I like Tatum a lot. Um, But next up, we have the Nets. Um, Nets. I guess if you want to go start it off. Yep. Um, I had a pretty pretty simple question. Um, Why? 
why even hard. play? Because yeah. um, let me let me read a list off my phone. This is what their current rosters looking like right now. Let me just give you a little taste. Obviously, they brought in Jamal Crawford and um, Michael Beasley, um, two guys who have had a lot of experience. And then outside of them, you go Karis LeVert, Joe Harris, Tyler Johnson, Garrett Temple, uh, Chris Chioza, Timothy Luau, <laughs> Cavaro, and you got Jeremiah Martin, Justin Anderson, Musa. Not going to try to say his first name. Rodion's Kuruks. Probably Spart. Uh, Jared Allen. And then that's it. They don't really have anyone else. And I wouldn't really call those people like anyone anyway. But I, I still think – I think this kind of like um, what the second bubble – we might talk about that a little later. But what the second bubble might do for those lower tier teams is that with – Kyrie out with KD out with uh, DeAndre Jordan out, uh, yada yada. I think that this this for the Nets it really gives an opportunity for guys who are like you know fringe rotational players um, and fringe league guys like make a name for themselves. Like especially guys like I was talking about Jamal Crawford and Michael Beasley who are out of the league and the Nets just brought them in now and they can really make a case for being on a team next season. Um, because I don't really think that the Nets, even though they're probably going to be in the playoffs because the Wizards are looking – somehow their roster is looking a lot worse than that. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think it's just a great opportunity for those kind of Well, guys. do we know their schedule? I mean, actually, yeah, that's – you said it perfectly. The Wizards aren't going to be able to compete for that, especially without Bradley Beal. Yeah. So. My, uh, my big question for the Nets was, will they win a game and will next year be, be here sooner? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they're really invested in this year. And I guess there's some important future. Um, I think there's some players that can benefit, uh, mainly Karis LeVert. I think uh, – I, d- I definitely am excited to watch him play because he's shown some really uh, good signs. I mean, he had that 150-point game, obviously, but he's been a pretty good player for his entire career. So it- it's going to be good to watch. I want to see what he can do as, th- like, I don't want to call him the guy, but I guess he is. I mean, right now on the Nets, he's probably the guy, so – uh, I yeah. want to see if he can be the guy next to Kyrie and KD next season, you know, if he can produce. This is just kind of a test for him to show if they're either going to trade him and get a, another guy for maybe a big three or maybe keep him. He'll be a really good player. For him. Yeah, I really wish they didn't extend him. I feel like it would have made it a lot more entertaining to see him kind of reach for the bag a little bit. Mm. Well, another thing that we're going on is he could be upping his trade stock mm-hmm. now because um, – We've all heard the rumors. Third star in Brooklyn would be cool. Um, so, yeah, this could be a good opportunity for a guy like Kara Silver to um, maybe play well enough to where the Nets can give up less to get a Bradley Beal or a Drew Holiday kind of guy. So, if we don't have anything left for the Nets, next up we got the Dallas Mavericks. Um, my question, Mark, for them is – it was kind of a little more vague, but is this team ready for a playoff run? Because we haven't seen Luka or Kristaps play in the playoffs before. Um, obviously, they're two great players. Uh, Luka is one of the best in the league. Um, but outside of them, they're not very deep. And like we're talking about, depth is very important, especially now. Um, but like I said, we haven't seen Luka or Kristaps, so it should be interesting to see what they can do in the playoffs. And I feel like they have a lot of pressure because – uh, you know, Luca is Luca, and he was like in MVP conversations for part of the year. But you know, I just don't know if that team with the lack of experience is going to be able to do much in the playoffs. Yeah, uh, is Seth Curry is he healthy? I'm, or is he injured? I'm sure he's. I think he's healthy. He's, he's healthy. Yeah, I like Seth a lot, but I yeah. I have for the Matt. I guess if you you're going to extend on that archery. Yeah, sorry. Something started playing in my headphones. Uh, yeah, Seth, the the Mavericks, like, I just feel like somebody like Seth, if he's healthy, I thought he might be injured. But, I mean, I guess I was just going to say they don't have the, a crazy amount of shooting. You know, I mean, they have Chris Stapps and Luka, but they don't have a lot of shooters off the bench other than, like, uh, J.J. Barea or something. Does yeah. Dorian Finney-Smith start? He's actually a um, decent shooter. I mean, I don't think he's good. But I can't really I feel like he plays. It just like Seth Curry is a guy that can make a shot every time, you know. Yeah. 
Maybe yeah, DeLon Wright starts. I don't, I don't really remember. Well, um, Luca, I think they go Luca, Tim Hardaway, maybe Dorian Finney-Smith, and then – I think that's what it yeah, is. I don't, I don't know. Something like that. Not, not yeah. Sure. But, I mean, well, you can barely even – the Mavs depth, like you said, Beach, is just not an incredible uh, feat. And I, I honestly, like, Luca, this is his second year. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's a great player. But, again, I kind of want to see some – this is a really big moment. I want to see if he can actually stitch something together. Because right now it's kind of looking like, you know, oh, he has a great future, but maybe not right now is, is his time to win. But – We'll see. Chris Stapps could totally pop off this, so I'm yeah, excited to watch. For Chris Stapps especially, like, since the end of Jan- January, he was averaging, like, 25, 11, and 3 with, like, two blocks, and he was shooting the ball well, too. And I think if he can continue uh, or pick up where he left off after the season, um, the hiatus, you, all, you know, all that happened, um, that's going to be huge for them, too. But I think it's going to be a big game of whoever they match up with. But I still think they can make a run. But I just think the likelihood yeah. is going to be big. My big question was, can Kristaps, like, be more assertive with Luca on the floor? Because he played really well without Luca, And even with Luca towards the end of the year, he started to play a little better. But I felt like he wasn't assertive enough. So it would be nice to see Porzingis kind of take over a couple games instead of letting Luca run the offense and him kind of demanding it on the block or even on the wing. Um, but I think this team, this team definitely needs mm-hmm. – a better seed if they're going to want to win in the first round. I think the Clippers matchups could be really tough. So yeah, all those teams in the West are kind of stacked. Uh, five through seven are all like game or two difference. So if they can move up a little bit and knock somebody else down, that'd be huge for them. Um, yeah. I guess if we want to, we can uh, move on really fast uh, to the Nuggets. Yep. Nice stuff for the Nuggets. I kind of had two questions I couldn't really de- decide between. Um so I'm just going to go through one of them now. I might bring another one up later. But obviously, what is this new skinny Jokic form going to bring to the table? Because at the beginning of 2019, Jokic was like 284 or it was something like that. He and looks now, like really skinny in that photo. Yeah. Like, and he lost from – like during the regular season, he lost like 25 pounds. Since the hiatus, he lost like 40. So he should – so he's probably like – forty. Yeah, he lost 40 pounds. Oh, my God. Is, is that, like, confirmed, or is that just, like, a figure people have kind of – Well, that's what Wode said. Okay. Brian Windhorse. I mean, 40, they both it. That's, that's 60 pounds. That's 65 pounds since the beginning. Great oh math. I know. Nice job. ACT session. I, I can't, I can't do up. math in front of you guys anymore. Every time I do, it just – I get bur- a barrage of comments. Um, yeah, I, so he should I be – if we do the math, he should be – around 220 pounds which is crazy now Jeez. especially for a seven footer so he's always had weight problems too that's another yeah. thing he had problems with weight and then he just dropped 65 that's that's, that's something that to just the hat to that i mean, I mean yeah you gotta tip the hat that, having, having COVID? COVID? did he have yeah. COVID? yeah he did he did but, but yeah he I did he a big yeah. thing is like I is that going to be like a positive or a negative for him? Because he was he was a guy who used, um, with lack of a better term, he used like his his, his girth. Flag. He used yeah. his girth. Like that was a big part of his game. Just just you know like the little that kind of stuff. He's a girthy um, boy. Let's just say that. But yeah, I think a big question is going to be is that going to be beneficial to him? And then I guess my second question is, um, what's going to be Michael Porter Jr.'s role? I think that's something we should definitely think about too. Yeah, mine was mine was will Mike Malone actually play Mike Porter Jr. Uh, I think he's I don't I don't think he's really gonna change them as like title contenders or not, but he might in the future, um, as he gets kind of integrated into playing. But with Jokic, uh, you know, losing all that weight, I know one of the things that he's not great at is defense, um, and general athleticism, but I feel like losing all that weight might not benefit his as athleticism as much as he'd want it to. The NBA has got a lot of great athletes, and uh, he's still at the end of the day not that athletic. So I don't think that's really going to change him all that much. I feel like he. I mean, it's definitely going to help. Kind of needed, I mean, yeah, it's going to help, help him in that aspect, but it's not going to push him to the point where I would tell him to lose sixty pounds. I mean, he also might just be healthier in general, have a little bit more stamina. I mean, it it, it never it never Last hurts. Year. I mean, Last year, he almost played like fifty minutes in the playoff game when it went to like double overtime. So he's got the stamina. I mean, yeah, I know, but just at the same time, you're bringing up the athleticism. I feel like there's pros and cons to both sides. Like, yes, he's a bigger guy. He can kind of bully his way. But 
uh, when he's big, but when he's maybe the skinny Jokic uh, can be faster, you know? Maybe he can just – It won't make him faster, but it won't make him faster than the average NBA athlete. That plays – even that plays center. I don't really? think that it's going to – I don't think it's going to be that game. Well, another thing that I don't think is, is, like, do we even know if he wants that to be his the form? Like, we don't even know if Skinny Jokic is going to be a thing by playoff time, you know? Like, this could yeah. just be him not really, like, eating that much and just trying to be healthier in general as a person, not as a basketball player. You <laughs> know, maybe well, – It's kind of hard to gain. We don't really know the answer. I mean, we, just, we got about, like, two weeks before, like, the first kind of – we got less than two weeks. I think the – like the preseason, or I guess the preseason, like the scrimmage games kind of started on the 22nd. And when we're recording this, it's July 11th. I mean, when was that so, photo taken, though? Has anybody seen Jokic since? Well, he's still like, he still hasn't traveled. I don't think he's in Orlando yet. He's had some complications traveling from Serbia because of the virus. Yeah, but I don't know. I think that. to put 60 pounds on in that. I know, but that. at the same time, to make an assumption like that, uh, the fact that, oh, well, he's skinny now. He's going to be skinny for, I feel like. Maybe he's he might not put 60 out. pounds. There's no way on earth he can put 60 pounds. I know. I'm not saying he's going to go back, but I I think he might not be that skinny. He might not be 220, maybe 240. Well, I mean, if he pounds in two weeks is a lot. I don't but wait, think when that, was that photo taken? That's the thing. That was taken like a couple weeks ago, but it's not like he went into hiding. Like he's still out and about now. I'm sure people are still seeing him. And he's still like – I don't think losing all that weight is just because of the virus. He's definitely been working out and putting a lot of work in. And I'm it's not, not like he doesn't that. want to be skinny and stuff. Um, well, I don't want to speak for him. I don't know. But, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just tough to say because, like, he's still working out and stuff, right? So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just think to make an assumption, I mean, yeah, I don't know. 40 pounds is a lot. And if that's – uh, the real number, that's crazy, and you might be right. Maybe this is the new Jokic, but I definitely think that it's not going to be as drastic as we think. You know, I mean, he could also just be struggling in the, in the uh, lady department in Serbia. I mean, Yeah, he needs he need a little bit of a confidence knows. booster down in yeah. Serbia. All right, All right. All right. what's up well, next? next up, up, got the got Houston the Rockets. Rockets. I think it's probably got the same question. How's the small ball lineup going to fail yeah. in the playoffs? Um, <clears throat> a lot of pros and cons to the small ball lineup. Defensively, um, anybody can switch on to anybody. Um, they're running like P.J. Tucker at the five, um, sometimes Robert Covington too. And then offensively, it really um, spaces the floor for James Harden and Russell Westbrook, who both um, like to drive in a lot and dish it out. There's nobody really clogging up the paint like Clint Capella was um, before they made that trade. Um, so, you know, just like, we haven't really seen much from it. What we saw, it was not bad. It wasn't horrible, but now in the West, you're going to be going up against like the Rudy Gobert's and the Nikola Jokic's of the league. Um, so I guess the only real downside to that would be defensively against those big dominant kind of centers. So it should be really interesting to see what they can do in the playoffs with that kind of lineup running the floor. So, all I'd say, yeah. the only big concern would be, the, like, the, the stronger bigs inside, really. So I yeah. would say the, uh, the deal breaker for the Rockets, I mean, they won, like, against, I think, the Jazz, the Lakers, and then another big team, too. And in their last three games of the year season, they lost to teams under 500. I remember one of those was the Hornets, like, three in a row to them. Uh, and it's really just if they make their threes or not. I don't think – it's going to – I understand they allow a lot of points on the other end, but it's really just if they make their threes or not. Um, and I don't think that playing – it's essentially gambling on whether or not you're going to make all those threes. And I don't think basing it on whether or not you're going to have a good shooting night's reliable enough. Yeah, they rely a lot on some difficult shots, not exactly like a proven game plan to get them points every time. Yeah. Like, do they really have a play that can get them guaranteed points every time other than Harden chucking up a three-pointer? Yeah. Everyone sit on the wing and hope you get – Yeah, get open or something. Um, another question I had about the Rockets was just, like, I feel like maybe this isn't as big as an issue anymore because they've had a lot of time to work it out. But the Russell Westbrook-James Harden duo is definitely one of the weirder in the league, in my opinion. They're both pretty ball dominant. Uh, it's just – I feel like it conflicts a lot. And maybe in the regular season it's not that big of a deal. But when each game matters as much as it does in the playoffs – I think it's going to be uh, interesting to see how that plays out. Because some games maybe 
Harden wants the rock and then some maybe Westbrook. So, I mean, there's, there were definitely some kinks they had to work out and I hope it works out for them, but I don't know. I don't think, I don't think that's something I'm really concerned about, um, especially in the playoffs. Like James Harden's not going to be wanting the ball every single time. You know what I mean? And especially since they cleared out the paint, um, they can both operate. I'm not worried about it. Mike D'Antoni is one of the best offensive coaches in the league. I, I think he can figure it out. And they've been a good team. They're in the playoffs. Um, so I'm not really too concerned about it. Um, yeah, it's just something to look for. If if anything, I mean, like you said, like the small ball and is one of the only things you can talk about from bad for the Rockets. I just think that this is something to look for. I mean. And plus, there are two guys that haven't won shit yet. So they're going to – they're probably going to yeah, they're going to want to do it. I'm going to want to win. So, like, who cares who's taking the ball up? Really? Yeah. So, um, if we have nothing else to say, next team, um, we got the Indiana Pacers. My question mark – it's not really that big of a question mark. I just said, how are they going to fare without, like, experience from a guy like Victor Oladipo, who we saw a lot from um, in that – I think that was 2018, um, in that series when he won up against LeBron, when he won most improved – but they've been fine without him, um, at least in the in the regular season. They they've been more than fine. They've been great. They're the they're the five seed in the East. Um, they've had a lot of contributions from Malcolm Brogdon, T.J. Warren. Obviously, Sabonis was an All Star. Um, but one one thing that those guys don't have is the playoff experience, and I, th- I think that's something that really Victor Oladipo brought to the table for them. So I don't know. I mean, he's still gonna be with them, but he's just not gonna be on the court with them. Like he's traveling, he'll be on the bench stuff, but. The encore presence from a guy like Victor Oladipo is something that's going to be pretty big. And missing out on that, I think, could be a big negative for him. Yeah. Uh, my, my big question with the Pacers was a little bit further into the future. Uh, and it was, I mean, kind of based on whether or not they want to trade Oladipo. Um, it was just whether they want to continue to, like, try and win now with the players they have or would they be willing to trade Oladipo for some younger talent picks. I feel like the Pacers are a team that, kind of circled the same exact kind of area for the last feels like forever just continue to be mediocre outside of the Paul George I guess little yeah. era that they had going on um, but I feel like this is a team that doesn't know what direction it's trying to go in they have a lot of solid guys but I don't think anyone that's going to win you a playoff series yeah so, I agree so with it, that it'd just be nice to see them kind of pick a lane and whether that's sticking with Oladipo long term and hoping he's the guy um, or trading him and going more long-term success and trying to get some younger guys to do. Yeah, I definitely think that the Pacers, like, they are not in a position right now to do too well in the playoffs in general. Like, they're unless, like, Sabonis turns into a Greek god, there's nothing – nothing crazy is going to happen for them. They're, they're kind of just throwing a rock against the wall and expecting a different result, you know? Yeah. Right now. yeah. Like, it's just – I they, they can't compete, like – I don't see what they can do, especially without Oladipo. I think that they are definitely not even close to a contender, and they need to definitely work some stuff out in the offseason. Maybe get a big guy in free agency. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know if anyone's trying to get in. Well, exactly. Like, who wants to go to Indiana? Plus, like, they need – what's the bonus contract right now? Like, what is I that think like? he's making his money now. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Well, well, I mean, they just might have guys they need to pay. They just – Right now, it's not a good position for them, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think another thing is they're no matter really what happens in these eight games leading up to the playoffs, they're not going to have a favorable matchup going into the uh, playoffs. Probably the worst team that they're going to face um, potentially is going to be the Heat. And yeah, that's a good team. Like that's not a team. That's not. I I can't I can't really even seeing I can't really see the Pacers taking two games from them. So next right. up. We have the ooh, we have the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, my question: uh, Will the Clippers be all right, even though Kawhi and Paul George and all of them, their core hasn't really played many games together? I'm pretty sure. Um, let me look this. Let me double check. Yeah, Kawhi, Paul George, Patrick Beverly, Lou Williams, Montrezl Harrell. They've only played 50 minutes, 56 minutes together all season, and that's probably going to be the the kind of lineup that they're going to look to close games with. Um, plus. They added in a ton of new guys at the trade deadline and in the buyout market. Um, they added, they brought in Joakim Noah, Marcus Morris, and um, Reggie Jackson. And then with the league going on hiatus, they didn't really have much time to kind of 
insert themselves into the into the system of the Clippers, um, their their whole rotation system. So I think it's definitely something to look to look out for. I think Kawhi. I, I don't think it's really something to be extremely worried about. Um, like I said, with Ka- a guy like Kawhi being the main guy there, um, he's a guy that just knows how to win, especially in the um, in the postseason. It worked last season. So, but I think it's definitely something to look out for, especially with all the new guys they added. Yeah, all year the thing I've been concerned about is Paul George's health, and honestly, I I think their success is going to be based on his health. Um, just because I, I don't think his shots been there. I just feel like he hasn't been there as a player either, just with that shoulder injury. I really hope he's back to 100%. Yeah, uh, I just I was when I was doing research for this, I kind of ran into a little bit of a a path like. They're kind of like – I don't want to compare them to the Rockets per se, but they definitely rely on difficult shots a lot, a lot more than other teams at least. I mean, they don't – again, like the Rockets, they don't have a set play that they can go to and just get points every time, you know. Like they got to kind of bank on something, some other factors. It's a little bit of like a gamble every once in a while. So when the when the games matter like a playoff game does, uh, I want to see if they are my fi- uh, finals favorite. I think that they are the best team and they will win. That's just my opinion, but the only thing stopping them is just there is a little bit of gambling going on. All right. And we got the other LA team now, the uh, Lakers. The Lakers. My question is, <laughs> if they don't win a championship this year, um, will they ever? And I think I can go ahead and answer that, and I'm gonna say no. Even though they got LeBron and AD, um, LeBron is 36. Years or he'll be 36 next year. Um, the Warriors going to be healthy next year. They'll have Clay back. They'll have Steph Curry back. Uh, and Draymond and Wiggins, and then um, the Nets are going to be healthy. A team that they could face in the finals next year. And then there's a lot of young, young up and coming teams in the, especially in the West too, um, fighting for the eight seed. And you have like the Mavericks and so and then the Nuggets too. And then. I just don't know if – yeah, especially the Bucks too, Sixers in the East. I just don't know if LeBron's going to be able to keep doing it. Um, obviously, he's 35 and still probably the best player in the league. But, I mean, he's only getting older. He's not getting any younger. Um, and I just don't know if they, – they just don't really have the assets to bring in a third killer. Um, so, I just don't know. If, if they don't win it this year, will they ever is my question. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, AD could even leave this year if they don't win at all. Um, mine was more so just once again with the depth stuff. If AD or LeBron gets Corona, I mean, they're screwed. Yeah, um, they don't really have much depth that, at all. That was kind of the point I was going to make. Uh, but I, I like the point Beach made, so I'll pass it on the Archer. All right, yeah, uh, not much to say. I do like that. Uh, I, I think ever is a stretch because, I mean, ever is a long time. But, I'm just talking about with like this. Goal. Yeah, like this. This right. kind of AD LeBron. Making sure you're not counting them out in like 20 years. That'd be kind of crazy. But <laughs> that's still uh, far down the line. Yeah, like like you said. I mean, not really much I can add. Just if LeBron or AD gets hurt, they are honestly, uh, honestly, LeBron could probably end up carrying them. I mean, he's that good. I think even at 35, it's possible. But they definitely will benefit from it, Anthony Davis being there. So. We will see how it plays out, but I like the point you guys brought up. So. Yes. Um, next up, we got the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, my question is, is this 3.5 game cushion going to be enough to keep them in the eight seed? Because I feel like there's a lot of guys creeping up. Obviously, the Pelicans are there. Um, they're back and healthy. The Blazers are back and healthy. The Kings are a guy or a team that I'm kind of afraid of too. There's their team that you can't really sleep on. Um, so I'm just thinking, is this three and a half game cushion going to be enough? Because we're going to have to win probably four games to to even to lock the eight seed probably. Um, but a, a big thing for us too is we're going to have Jaron Jackson. He's going to be back from injury. Um, he missed a lot of times so and he's the same with Brandon Clark. And then kind of another mini question that I have is how is Justice Winslow going to kind of add into the mix? He's a guy he can really um, – he can score the ball if you need him. He'll probably start at the three next to uh, Dylan Brooks. Um, but he also brings a lot of great defense um, on the wing. Um, he can 
playmake too. He can he can take the ball out of Jaws' hands when um, necessary to run the floor. So, but I I would say my my um, my question is kind of more so based on if they can maintain the AC. Yeah, mine was uh, I guess more just based on like will they kind of shoot themselves in the foot really? Just because I mean if the uh, if they end up retaining the eighth seed, I mean. They have to lose two straight games to whoever the ninth seed is, yeah. and I just I don't see that happening. With I mean I, I understand the teams behind them are very talented too, um, but with the talent that they have, I don't see them losing two games in a row to any of the teams behind them. Um, I I just it's whether or not they're going to shoot themselves in the foot late in the game or not. Um, but I like the Grizzlies to make the eighth seed. I just don't see any team behind them beating them two times in a row. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, uh, for the Grizzlies, uh, I. I do think that, like, you guys, again, brought up some great points, but I think that I'm really excited to watch Jaw play. I mean, he's been in, like, these playoff games can be really similar to, like, an NCAA tournament kind of uh, vibe, especially when you're, like, in this bubble and everybody's, like, there. Like, every everything revolves around the bubble, you know? So maybe Jaw, like, pulls out something crazy and performs at such an elite level. Like, I, I think he can be that guy for them for the future, 100%. He deserves Rookie of the Year when he wins it. And uh, I do think that the Grizzlies will end up getting the eighth seed. It just depends on uh, what these other teams can do healthy because we haven't exactly seen them all at full health like we will. And one more thing before we take our break, I'm going to say that as a Grizzlies fan, I don't think we're going to – if we make the playoffs, um, I don't think we're going to do anything. We'll be a first-round exit. But, uh, like, when you were talking about John Morant, this is a very young team. Um, I think we're one of the youngest teams in the league, if not the youngest. We have, like, one player over 30 years old. But I think this playoff experience, just on the big stage, even though there's no fans, um, but just this kind of, like, getting in the routine of the playoffs, um, this kind of thing is priceless, for, uh, especially for a young team um, who's looking to make a lot of noise down the line. So I would say that um, that would be big for him, too. All right. Well, if we are ready to get a break, that's what we'll do. So I'll talk to you guys after. Sounds good. See ya. Yeah. All right, we're back from our break, and we are up with the Bucks. Go ahead, Paige. Actually, we're on the Heat. Actually, on uh, the heat. we're on the Heat. My bad. <laughs> um. So my question for the Heat, um, is can the Heat make a run in the East without a superstar caliber player? Um, I feel like that's kind of asking a lot. The Bucks. The Bucks have Giannis. Celtics have Tatum. The Raptors have Siakam, Sixers have Embiid. Um, the Heat just don't well, really have a guy on that I level. Mean, Jimmy Butler. I would Jimmy say. Butler is not on the level of those guys. I, don't I know. mean, maybe not on the level, but he is up there. He's not, the I wouldn't say he's a superstar. He's player. not a bomb, but he's not a superstar. He's somewhere in between. Yeah. He's like borderline superstar. He's I would say he's, he's like on the fence. Superstar. He has but two he's legs. Not a guy, the he's not a guy you can give the ball to in, in a situation like all these other guys. I feel like he's but I'll, I'll, I definitely I'll, think you could, but go ahead. He's I'll not going to be taking 35 shots a game like Kawhi would. That's what I'm talking about. You can't about. run an offense through him. I agree um, with that. But like I'm saying, if you look at the previous champions, they've all had that guy. You know what I mean? So if you go down the list um, of those previous champions, you got Kawhi last year, KD, LeBron, Steph Curry, Dirk, Kobe. The list goes on and on. Like the last team without a big superstar kind of guy. Um, that I'm talking about to win is like the early 2000s Detroit Pistons with uh, Chauncey, Ben Wallace, Tayshawn Prince in them. So what I'm really saying is, can this team play such great team ball to have a 2004 Pistons type run? Like the only experienced guys on that team are Jimmy Butler and retirement home Andre Iguodala. Everyone else of relevance, um, I'm not including Solomon Hill, unfortunately, is young. And I think that they can. So they're, they're my sleeper finals, like – pick in the east i think they can make a run but um yes. yeah i definitely think that jimmy butler like y- you you brought it up he isn't a guy you can run an offense through i i agree with that and he might not be on the level with some of the other guys you mentioned but he's definitely not just another guy on the team he's their he's their yeah, best player like, but like he can make a shot he has the the confidence he has extreme confidence plus he has a lot of experience and all these young guys are learning from him a lot. I think he's one of the – he's probably – if he's probably the best veteran guy I would want on a team to either help uh, my rookies out 
and or just produce for me. I mean, one of the best you can get from that perspective. But the Heat are definitely a force. They're a finals contender for sure. Yeah, my big question with the Heat was uh, neither Bam out of bio nor are uh, Kendrick Nunn. They're not with the team in Orlando right now. And I'm just thinking with, you know, a young group that's not really experienced in the playoffs, is this going to hurt them in the long run? Um, you know, kind of getting integrated back into the system. Do we know why time. they're not in Orlando? They, they got the virus. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they're, they're not they're in kind of Orlando. Down. They're going to be there soon, of course, but will that yeah. be enough time to be integrated uh, and get them back to being healthy, really? Um, but, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they play. And I guess moving on, uh, next we actually do, um, I think, have the Bucks. Yeah, uh, a team with a superstar. So we can go ahead yeah. and yeah, um, skip over to them. Yeah, so my really my question was what happens if Giannis gets stopped? Um, I mean, Chris Middleton's a guy who's cool, but he's not really there. He can't really create his own shot. The whole offense really revolves around um, Giannis. And we kind of saw that happen in the Eastern Conference. Was it the East? It was whenever they played the Raptors. I think that was the Eastern Conference Finals. But um, they just put Kawhi on Giannis, and he kind of got shut down, and then nobody else could really pick up the slack. Um, so I think my big question is, can they keep Giannis from getting stopped? And if he does get stopped, can somebody step up, like an Eric Bledsoe, maybe even a Dante DiVincenzo kind of guy, step up offens- offensively to uh, help him get some buckets, help him score, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I would I would say a very similar thing. Um, I don't know if he was necessarily specifically guarded by Kawhi, but I would say that the Raptors in general built a wall. Yeah, it, it was the whole system. Siakam has the same ability to do that uh, that Kawhi did. Um, so I wouldn't be shocked if the Bucks have to rely on other guys, but I mean, there's going to be an open man, and last year it happened to be Bledsoe. Um, yeah. They just didn't shoot very well last year anyway. Well, Bledsoe, to a degree, was a detriment in that series. <laughs> um, he had a couple of good games, but he was also taking a lot of shots. If they can somehow maneuver, I guess, Chris Middleton taking more of those open shots, that'd be ideal. But Didn't they just Lopez get... take over a couple games, or was that a different series? No, Lopez played super well that series. Yeah, that that, kind of thing, I think but he's not having the kind of yeah. season he had last year, though. No. So. Yeah, it's just – He didn't shoot very well last just... series, though, did he? I know his percentage wasn't that great. This season, this season, this, this season he hasn't shot. He hasn't well. shot that well. No, I mean, in the, I mean, in, I mean, in the playoff series against the Raptors. No, Lopez played really well that. Did series. he? Did he have a good shooting? Like, was he shooting well though? All right. Yeah, I thought I saw a statistic where he didn't, but Bledsoe was, was the one that kind of sold him. He he took more shots than he he just they left Bledsoe open and Bledsoe kept missing. Um, yeah, yeah. But I would say they just have to um, find the next guy up. Yep, yeah. and they kind of need. Like they're also they're like kind of their closing lineup is a little iffy too, because Brooke Lopez is not the most athletic guy. Um, so that'd be something to look forward to, to look uh, out for as well. So uh, next up we got the New Orleans Pelicans. Um, obviously they're chasing the Grizzlies in the eight seed, um, but my question for them um, is can they really get going defensively? I think that not having uh, Jeff Bizdelic, their assistant coach, is going to be a big negative for the Pels. Um, a lot of times when we think of assistant coaches, we don't really spend much time thinking about how they help the team because they're just assistants per se. But uh, Jeff Bizdelic is one of the best defensive minds in the NBA. I know this firsthand. He spent two seasons as a Memphis Grizzlies uh, assistant coach. And after that, he was a huge part of that Rocket staff for a few years. Um, when Mike, and T- Mike D'Antoni, obviously – a guy notorious for not giving a damn about defense. And that's where Jeff Bizdelic came in. Um, then middle of 2018, Bizdelic retired. And just like that, the Rockets were one of the worst defensive teams in the league. So bad that he unretired. And then the Rockets were back to being a good team again, or being a good defensive team again. I say all that because I think that the Pelicans are kind of in a similar situation coaching wise as the 2018 Rockets. Alvin Gentry, um, he's obviously an offensive minded type of guy like D'Antoni. So, I don't know. Maybe we could see a large defensive fall off, but it's tough to say. Um, um, one I thing think. I would say, I guess, to address that was Alan Gentry has asked a very similar question about, I guess, Jeff Bisdelic, whatever his role uh, in these, I guess, little bubble games. Um, and he said that he's been – his voice has been heard in every par- practice remotely, even though he's not there. And even during the games, they uh, – He's going to be yeah. involved still. Um, You're going to be on one of those tablets. But still, on the, yeah. on but still not having it's, not it's having gonna hurt them. Be big. I, I don't I don't disagree with that, but I don't think that they're necessarily going to lose defensive focus. Um, but I also don't necessarily think that they're going to get the eight seed. It's going to be 
very tough to beat the Grizzlies three times. Um, but my question would be going into this offseason. Uh, last offseason, Lonzo, Brandon Ingram, and Zion were all injured. Um, and I'd honestly just be grateful if they could all go into the offseason healthy and stay healthy throughout the offseason and see what, you know, this young team can become if all those guys stay healthy. Um, and so I guess that would be my one question for the Pels is if those three, four guys could stay healthy and have an offseason yeah. where it can all grow. I just, I just want to watch LeBron mm-hmm. versus Zion. I just, I just want to give the people what they want, and I want to watch LeBron versus Zion, but that might not end up happening. So. Well, they could have played in the, uh, in the, in the eight games, but – they gave them an easy schedule, so <laughs> so that they could have that playoff series. <laughs> well, we'll see. we'll see. You know the sweep yeah. for the oh, Lakers. Jokes. But yeah, um, if we don't have anything else to say, next up, OKC Thunder. My question mark was, should they be taken seriously? I feel like the Thunder have always been counted out uh, this season because nobody really expected them to be here in the first place. Um, I just feel like they're a really weird team, a weird put together team. I just get that sense for some reason. But especially in the playoffs, Chris Paul is a guy you can really never count out. He's a fighter. He's just one of the best leaders in the league. Um, so I think if Chris Paul can bind this weirdly put together team, then they should definitely be taken seriously. But I for sure think it's going to it's gonna be up to CP3. Although I do want to see how uh, Shea and Gallinari are going to do. But I think it's yeah. up to Chris Paul. Yeah, I would say this is a team with probably the biggest upset potential. Chris Paul is a guy that yeah. seems to always play incredibly well in the playoffs until he gets injured. Hopefully this time off has kind of let him focus on his body and make sure he's healthy uh, for this playoff run. But if he's healthy, I feel like they can make some noise. Yeah, and he had all that time. Like, that could be really beneficial for him in particular. Mm -hmm. All right. And so I guess if that's all kind of for the Thunder, um, up next is the Magic. Um, Yeah, this is kind of a tough team to kind of formulate a question on. Um, But I would say – are they going to be fully healthy? And I say this with Jonathan Isaac in mind. Um, he's easily one of the best defenders in the league. He's a really versatile, athletic uh, guy, a defensive force. Very, he got all the physicals, his height, his length. He averaged almost three blocks a game at one point, two steals. He was making a case for the uh, all-defensive team. We know all that. Um, he would just be so nice for the Magic to have alongside Vucevic, Aaron Gordon, Evan Fournier, and some other guys who really aren't that sound defensively. Um, and he hasn't really he hasn't been ruled out yet. So I think if they can have Jonathan Isaac on that team, it would help them make a lot more noise. And I think another thing that'd be big for them in the play in is if they can pass the um the Nets, which is very likely, um, and not have to face the Bucks in the first round, then that could be something that's also very big for them. Yeah, I mean the Raptors were a team that they got a game on last year yeah. DJ Augustine's heroics. Uh <laughs> My boy I mean, Gasol did not want to close out. Yeah, I, I don't know if they're going to get as lucky this year. But, I mean, I really do think this team is a very young team. But I would say the question for them, mine was more so looking towards the future, is will they develop these younger players? The Magic had a history of being bad and getting these younger draft picks, but not necessarily doing a great job developing them. I really like Fultz. I really like Isaac. I mean, even Aaron Gordon, I feel like, is going to be better every year. But he is. Mo Bamba, too. Uh, I mean, Mo Bamba, too. Yeah, I totally forgot about him. It'd just be nice to see them kind of feature some of these younger guys. I know yeah, maybe and Bruce Chuma out there, Okiki. But... Yeah, give him more of a uh, role. Is he back? Is Okiki back? No. Okay, I, I have no idea what my, my guy is doing. I'm going to be playing the face of the earth. Um, he yeah, Magic, is. the real question for me is just can they progress with some of these younger guys and hope that they grow? Yeah, I think Fultz is the guy to watch. Uh, I mean, obviously Vucevic, but offensively they don't have a lot besides him and Fultz. Um, Aaron Gordon, I mean, he's he's okay. I mean, there's nothing crazy I'll special. Count out, I'll count out Fournier. Fournier is, I mean, yeah, Fournier, is, Fournier is a killer. Fournier is good, but, I mean, they just don't have – I mean, like you said, they don't have that guy. They're not a, they're not a contender. <laughs> I mean, Vucevic can – give him as much as he can but how much is that I mean if he gave them all he could in the regular season and how many games did they end up winning like 25 like Not enough. Enough. yeah yeah um, like just I, I don't know there's nothing they can do to really progress in the playoffs I do am um, I am looking forward to watching Fultz though I think people counted him out really soon and I I, I wouldn't be surprised if you put up a couple good games but yeah I actually like all you need. yeah because so he fixed his jump shot Next up is his old team, actually, in uh, the Philadelphia 76ers. Yeah, this is a team that uh, I'm very interested to see. And um, 
if they can win with um, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. And I think if they don't, then people are going to start to say they're going to bring back the um, – that they bring back the rumors that they can't really play together and all that stuff. My question um, wasn't really related to Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, but I was saying, do you risk taking a solid defender out of the starting lineup to make room for shooting? Um, obviously, that lineup of Ben Simmons, Josh Richardson, Tobias Harris, Al Horford, Joel Embiid is cool and all. Well, I guess they're more than cool, especially defensively. But they got no shooters among them. Off the bench, they have two terrific shooters, though. They got Furkan Korkmaz and Shake yeah, Milton. Bro, he pops off. Um, Korkmaz Furkan, literally has he dropped, crazy. He dropped like 40 against the Grizzlies. Um, yeah, he dropped like 40 against the Bulls, too. Like, he, yeah, like he can – if he's on, he's on. But then Shake Milton, too, uh, he can also create for himself as well, not to shoot. So I think they should definitely um, incorporate one of them into the probably the starting shooting guard spot instead of Josh Richardson, or maybe uh, move Josh Richardson to the three, Tobias to the four, take Horford off the bench. I think that'd probably be the best thing to do. Um, but I think just having the shooting and the and just more shot creation, kind of like from a guy like Shake Milton, um, and incorporating that into a playoff team is definitely something that's huge. And if they don't do that, I think it'll be a detriment to them. Yeah, I, I actually the same thing with Shake Milton, uh, just because of his shot creation. I feel like they really like that in their starting lineup um but I also had a second question is if they lose who gets the x whether that's it's Brett Brown. Or Brett Brown yeah Brett Brown I mean it's it's a really well I actually don't know if I'd say well put together they have some issues clearly um but they also have the talent the talent's be, there um I mean last year they were there uh they could have easily been in the finals they were um, one if that bounce off their way they should yeah. I mean um, yeah. that's I mean, that's, that's an incredibly talented team. I, I don't have any doubt about their young talent, but I do have doubt, I guess, kind of about their coaching. And if, this, if these two guys can coexist, as they're both kind of, you know, yeah, players yeah. inside the paint. But I do think adding Shake Mill will help a lot. They don't really have a lot of shot creators in that starting lineup. Um, and he's a guy that can do a bucket or two. Yeah, uh, I feel like if you can't make the finals without – uh, I mean, if you can't make the finals with Jimmy Butler, what makes you think you can do it without, especially when your biggest free agent uh, acquisition, I mean, Al Horford plus Tobias Harris. I mean, they're they're good, but they, I mean, Tobias Harris got a crazy bag. They're not going to be able to really uh, give a lot in the future too. So like you said, Peyton, who's getting the ax? <clears throat> We will uh, definitely be uh, watching for the next couple of years. I don't think that they're going to put anything crazy together. They're definitely a team that can that can win, but it just depends on how they can win. You know, can they put together yeah. some shooting? I've I've felt bad about the Sixers recently, and I think I think the shooting they just add one guy in there, and I think that makes me a lot more confident in their chances. But yeah, and um, the home court home court advantage. I mean, losing that's also yeah, that's hurt. also yeah, big. that's big because they're awful on the road. But I don't know. Maybe with no fans cheering against them, yeah, it's just kind of like the AAU tournament kind of vibe thing. But Joel won't let it go to his head anymore. Yeah, he won't get teary eyed. Next up, uh, we got the Phoenix Suns, a team that nobody really thinks gonna do anything in the playoffs, especially losing Kelly Oubre. Um, so I'm looking more towards the future. I, I said, um, what would Devin Booker do if the Suns still make the playoffs? Because something that came out, I think it was either today or yesterday, but um, he was apparently upset at the Phoenix Suns organization for not uh, pursuing a trade for D'Angelo Russell, uh, one of his good friends. So I think he's been there for a while. He's put up the stats. They just haven't won. And that seems like that, that, that can get frustrating, um, especially if your team's not really putting together a good team. or They're not a bad team. They're not putting the pieces like a D'Angelo Russell um, kind of guy who's better than a Ricky Rubio um, around him. And I can definitely see that could be frustrating um, and his two best or two of his best friends, Russell and Towns, are up there in uh, Minnesota. So, I mean, could he request a trade kind of thing? Could he um, walk after whenever his contract ends? I'm not sure. I know he just got extended uh, pretty recently, but um, I don't know. I just look. I'm just looking more towards the future because I don't really think they can do anything in the bubble. Yeah, I agree. Just not much they can do, and I'm not looking for them as a a good team at all. I mean. I'm not going to be surprised if Devin Booker leaves within the next year. Like, I would say not having Uber is really going to hurt him. But the thing I wanted to point out, um, I guess my question was, will Devin Booker become like a vocal leader? I feel like he hasn't really – he's been leading statistically that team for a while now, but I feel like he hasn't really stepped up as a leader. 
Um, I, I know he's really young still, and I feel like Monty Williams is going to be a great mentor for him. Um, but, like, even that 70-point game, it's cool that he had 70 points. But That's after that, I don't think he's yeah, they lost. satisfied yeah. taking pictures and, like, smiling about it. Like, you guys lost. Um, and it's cool and I'll score that much. But I, I don't – I feel like it would be better if you could see, like, his dedication. I understand he's upset, but I feel like I haven't really seen him express that as much as I'd want to. If he could come out there and, like, you know, get his teammates fired up a little bit. And, yeah. You know, just – show that he cares it'd be really great instead of just telling people he doesn't want to be there he's frustrated yeah um, and take the, kind of matters into his own hands yeah, not much with the suns but uh, if we want to go ahead and move on who's up next next up we got the portland trailblazers um i think something that's on everyone's mind is how is zach collins and yusuf Nurkic going to come back if they're fully healthy can they make the um eight seed a lot more competitive and i think that they can I think Zach Collins, I'll start off with him. Um, kind of having him probably start at the four instead of Carmelo Anthony. Um, it brings a lot more, like, size and length and kind of just big man kind of kind of player off – or in your starting lineup. And then, obviously, um, we've, we've talked about Yusuf Nurkic and his impact. Um, he was in contention for an all-NBA team last year um, before his injury. And he's just a great player to have on the court. He opens up the uh, – the uh, interior offense for him to where it's really not just Dame and CJ um, and it's more Dame, CJ, Nurkic now. Um, so I think that my big question is how are they going to come back? Yeah, I, I had the same sort of thing. Nurkic is a big advanced statistics guy with his impact on the floor and everything. Um, but I, I know defensively Collins is going to help out a lot, but just I don't know if they're going to have enough time to necessarily integrate back into playing basketball and back into the Blazers system because they've both been out. I mean, I think they've both of them combined played like either six or four games this year, and those were all John, not John Collins, Zach Collins. So it'll be interesting yeah. to see how they kind of integrate back. In the yeah, <laughs> this definitely isn't – I don't think this is the year for the Blazers. I, I honestly, if I was them, I wouldn't even want to make the playoffs just to stay away from any injury concerns, you know, like – I don't what's, know. What's the point? I mean, especially I they when – They made it to the Western Conference Finals last year, and all they really lost was Al Farouk Aminu and Nurkic. Um, yeah, and I mean, this is also Nurkic a team that – There's a team during the regular season that's beat the Lakers, even on that Kobe tribute yeah. night. Yeah. And, I mean, the Lakers were motivated that night. I don't I don't think Dame's going to shy down from this at all. I feel like they, they honestly have any team that could get into eight seed, they have the best shot. It's just whether or not they can integrate those two guys. Yeah. I think that they're – Fully healthy, they're the best team not in the playoffs right now. Um, I agree. But I think that the cushion that the Grizzlies have is just going to be too tough for uh, for them to catch up. So next team, we got the Sacramento Kings. I don't really have a really a big question. Um, but I, I also don't want to kind of look towards the future because I do think that they could be a sneaky team to make the eight seed. Um, they're my sleeper team to, to, to take the play in. Um, obviously – it all really depends on how De'Aaron Fox uh, plays, and he played great when he came back after that injury. Um, so, yeah, that. And then also a big thing that they're going to have to look forward to, if I have to go to talk about the future, is um, – so I, I would say my question is, um, how is uh, Buddy Heald and Bogdan Bogdanovich going to share minutes? Because right now they got Buddy Heald off the bench. Obviously, um, he's not a – he doesn't want to come off the bench. Um, a guy of his talent wouldn't want to do that either. Um, but Bogdanovich is, I think he's, I'm pretty sure he's coming up on a contract here. They just extended Buddy Heald. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do with those two guys. I think that should be something very interesting to look out for. But I do think they can take the eight seed. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of worried about them. Yeah, I, I like the Kings a lot too. I guess my big question with the Kings is, is their history of being trash way too much to overcome? They haven't had playoffs in 13 seasons. Too much to overcome. I mean, if history tells you anything, they're not making the playoffs. Um, it's just, I mean, can they prove history wrong? It, it's it's going to be weird to see just because they're a team I really team. believe in, but they're always so close but not close enough. They they always muddle on this nine to well, – I guess they've been trash for a little bit. They, they, just, they just can't make the playoffs. It'll be really nice to see them kind of push over the edge if it's possible at all. But yeah, I guess uh, we could also ask is De'Aaron enough but. yeah I mean Bagley De'Aaron it's it's gonna be uh definitely I don't I don't know if I want to call them like they're good 
but I think they have a lot more potential in the years coming. I want to see Bagley develop a little bit more. I think his defense can be a lot better than it is. Uh, okay. Same with De'Aaron. If, I think that their defense both can improve a lot. And athletically, both very gifted players. As long as they can stay happy and maybe get a bit of a – some bigger bets around them, maybe build a winning culture, uh, they can yeah, be really good in the future. And I would say this is a team that's super streaky, so I wouldn't be shocked if they honestly went on a massive tear here. Post-All-Star break, if they were one of the best teams, like, statistically, in the yeah. league. I'd love to see De'Aaron um, pop off. And, I mean – they started off the year like 0 and 5, and then they ended up jolting up to like five. Like they just have these crazy runs while they're playing incredibly well. So it'll be interesting to see what which Kings team we end up seeing uh, yeah. in these couple games. Right. Um, and so next up, we've got the, we got Spurs, the Spurs, another team that's um, kind of all on the fringe. I had two words here for my question. I said uh, rebuild time, and I think that um, unfortunately it pains me. Even as a Grizzlies fan, it's it's gonna hurt to see the Spurs kind of take the um, take a backseat when it comes to um, winning or the playoffs. Uh, obviously, you can't really you can't hate Popovich, but they just don't have a team that's really put together to make a playoff run, especially after losing Lamarcus Aldridge. Um, I think it's about time to send him out, uh, find a new home for DeRozan, and just kind of embrace the rebuild because they got some good pieces. Dejounte Murray's cool. Uh, Derek White, he didn't have the he didn't have as good a season as he did last year, um, but he dropped like forty in a playoff game. So we've seen what he can do, and then plus um, Lonnie No Hair Walker. Yeah, Lonnie know. Walker too. Lonnie No Hair Walker. The aerodynamics. I think on them, it's just it's gonna be game changing. They just got they're just in a good place for a rebuild. Um, they're not. It's not like they're starting from scratch. So I think that it is time for a rebuild, and yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, would, I, I had rebuild as well down, and all three of those guards, I guess you could maybe throw on a small forward, but honestly, that would be shocked if during this playoff round they played one of those guys a lot and tried to kind of boost his trade value and package him with the Rosen for a guy that could play the uh, three or four a little bit better. than. I think they can get a big return if they just package Aldridge and uh, DeRozan together. Yeah, they probably. Yeah, I agree yeah, with that. I, I agree especially with that with as contender. well. Yeah, and especially I, I now that like Aldridge has a bit of a three point, that's yeah, very yeah. valuable. I, I feel like you're not going to be able to dump both of them at the same time because that's got to be a team that's like really desperate. Yeah, I mean it's all it's all just hypothetical. They just got to trade have, both of them. I don't care how they, they do. Yeah, I, I think I think in this little run though, they might try and find one of those guys and get them to succeed, and then maybe flip them with one of those guys and try and get. You know, a younger guy that can play anywhere. <laughs> All right. Yep, I agree. Um, next up, we got the Toronto Raptors. Uh, my question, uh, I kind of worded this a little weird, but does their depth make them bigger favorites now than in a usual uh, season? And I think that even after losing Kawhi, I think that the Raptors, um, they are one of the deepest teams in the league. They had a guy, they had like, guys come out of nowhere and start to uh, um, put up crazy numbers like Norman Powell, for example. Uh, I think he's one of the most underrated players in the league. Then obviously um, Fred Van Vliet after that um, playoff run, uh, he's really established himself. Also uh, Terrence Davis, now Pascal Siakam's the star there. And they just got a lot of good players coming off the bench. And I think especially in a time like this, like the, during the whole coronavirus thing, you've been talking about the depth um, for, for like the whole episode. Um, but I think they're, up there with the Clippers with probably the, one of the most deepest teams in the league. Um, so I think that's definitely going to be a huge thing that's going to help them, especially if uh, they struggle with the injuries after the three month period or um, God forbid someone gets the virus. But Yeah. Uh, I think they've got, they've got everything. They got shooting great coach. I like Nick nurse a lot. I mean, obviously they have a lot of playoff experience and they've been to the finals and won it last year. I think Siakam is an, one of the like, surprises I don't want to say surprises but just like the way he continued his play from the playoffs and the finals last year into the regular season uh, I know he got injured but I thought it was really impressive and uh I'm really I think Siakam is a superstar yeah I I agree with that but I would I would say my question um is I guess kind of who would take the last shot on this team because they got guys that can hit shots really high clips, like Man Bleed. And, I mean, even Lowry's a great leader, and he's one of those guys that want to take the last shot. Um, but with Siakam not necessarily being as big a perimeter threat as those guys, I mean, I don't I don't know who they want <clears throat> to have the ball in their hands at the end of the game. Last year they had Kawhi, and this year it's kind of a question mark. 
Um, yeah, but I still I think the Siakam's percentage is good from three, but I feel like if it's at the end of the game, they're going to have Yeah, his threes are more from – his threes are like from corner shots wide open when he gets sagged off of. They aren't exactly him creating his own shot from three. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Siakam can also – he also has a bit of a ball handle and he can create for others. So he can find a Kyle Lowry for three if or that's ben what they Lee. need or Freddie yeah, or sure. Ibaka. They just have a lot of guys. I mean, I think yeah, yeah. that – that's always something that's great to have, even if there's not a global pandemic. But especially now, I think it's uh, something that's huge for them. So right. second to the last team, we got the Utah Jazz. My question is who's going to step up with the Bogdanovich injury, um, especially offensively because he was good for 20 points a night and um, obviously the shooting too. And another thing is obviously the, there's a narrative being pushed about the whole uh, Rudy Gobert getting – uh, the virus and giving it to Donovan Mitchell and all that. Um, I don't really think that's something significant. Yeah. Um, if they want to win games, that's not going to affect them. Uh, so I think, but the guy that's going to have to step up for them is um, my guy, uh, Mike Conley. Uh, I really think in Memphis, we saw what he could do, especially also in the playoffs. He really elevated his game. I think he averaged um, like 28 in the playoffs for us uh, at the last year we were in it. And he had games where he put up uh, – uh, he had a couple 30-point games with the Spurs. But I think his veteran leadership should um, be what they need. I know it wasn't there in the in the regular season, um, but they're kind of expecting a lot less for him, from him now than they were kind of at the beginning of the season. So he's a guy that can really turn it on, and it wouldn't really surprise me. I would love it, um, but I just think he someone else needs to find their offense because uh, maybe it's Joe Ingles too, but um, I think it's someone else – I'd up. say Jordan Clarkson's got a pretty big mm-hmm. shot at being that guy. He already does put in a lot off the bench. But my question for the Jazz uh, would be, did they go all in to win too soon? Um, I personally think they should have tried to fit Donovan Mitchell's timeline a little bit better. I feel like they might have gone all in a little too early with the Conley trade as well as acquiring Bogdanovich. Um, I don't know if they're going to want to hit the reset button after this. It doesn't look like they're going to. Um, I just question – I just kind of question why they did this so early. I know Conley hasn't necessarily panned out like they wanted to, but with your best player being such a young star, I feel like they'd want to build up more draft capital and some younger players, especially in a smaller market um, where they could eventually trade those off for players his age or some more draft Another capital. thing, too, is um, I think this was a good I, – I disagree with you. I think this was a good time. I just think their cards didn't fall right. Um, yeah, I think Conley, Conley just wasn't. Sure. Yeah, Conley didn't pan out. Um, he didn't. He wasn't what they thought they'd be. And now, I mean, Bogdanovich was probably one of the most underrated signings of the of the uh, off season, but he's just not going to be there because of the injury. Um, so I don't know. I think it's going to be interesting. I still think Conley's got some good years left. Um, he's not going to be doing what he did in Memphis, averaging twenty one points anymore. But he's still going to be a good playmaker to have alongside Donovan Mitchell. Um, and he's going to be good for double-digit points when you need him to. Uh, I just think the change of scenery – he played in Memphis for, like, since 2007. Um, so the change of scenery is something that's very different from him. And he already had an established – he had a groove going in the 901. But I just think it's something that he has to ease into more. And I think he'll get more comfortable with um, more time there. But, I mean, it's not like he's elderly yet. So he's still got some good years in him. I think that I think they'll be fine. Uh, I really, yeah. I really think that they can do something next year for sure. Yeah, I just, I just think Donovan potentially in the future could be a championship guy, and I just, I don't want to think that they would rush it because they can't attract free agents. Um, and they're gonna have kind of have to rely on more draft picks and trades. Um, yeah, I, guess, I, I think see. that it, it's gonna depend on what happens in the future a lot more than we can't really predict that because they could totally get a good pick or uh, maybe like their scouts do a great job and they get a second round steal that gives them a lot of depth. So we'll see. Yeah, I picked I th- Gobert late and Nurkic. That's true. Yeah, I think they have the tools for sure to to be contenders in the future. I don't know about this year. Uh, also, that narrative with the Gobert Donovan Mitchell thing that was I think that was completely engineered yeah. by the media. People just like putting, oh, they play on the same team. They both got the virus. Now they hate each other. I think that was totally taken out of uh, – Well, Donovan Mitchell was a little hostile. I mean, I, I don't think, think he was hostile. hostile. I think he put it on, like, Twitter, and then it was like, okay. Like, I it mean, wasn't it, as big as a deal. He, did talk, he, he talked about it. He kind of did make a big deal. Yeah. About it. But if I just someone think Donovan that, Mitchell's it, family it got it. Yeah. I don't think it'll affect – they both want to win at the end of the day. I play yeah. yeah. That's what it all comes down to. 
All right. Well. Um, and kind of towards the opposite of winning, the last team we have is the Washington Wizards. And yeah, yeah. my question was, um, will, they, will they win a game? That's what nah. I wrote. Um, nah. They don't have Bradley Beal now. Uh, obviously, don't have John Wall. Don't have Bertans. Um, so who the hell is going to score? Garrison Matthews. He's going to average like 24, I guess. Um, but, you know, I think for them it's more looking towards – how is John Wall going to come back and Bradley Beal kind of next year? They're kind of looking down the line. And I think if they can pair up, they're going to have a good draft pick this year. I like Thomas Bryant. I like Troy Brown. Uh, Rui's cool, too. It just depends on um, who they draft. And I think they can really just be right back into the mix after John Wall. Uh, if he comes back, back, hopefully, uh, 100%. He's one of my favorite players to watch in the league. The other day I watched, I rewatched that, uh, that game winner. The whole game against the Celtics. I mean, he's just so such an electrifying player. Um, so I really hope he can come back 100. percent But if he does, I definitely think the Wizards can uh, can make something happen next year. Yeah, next yeah, year. My question was just John Wall being healthy for next year. I don't really have much yeah. to add. To that. Yeah, there really isn't much to say about this team. Uh, I honestly like to answer your question, Beach. I don't think they will win a game. I think all these teams are hungry. I, th- I think all these teams need the wins as much as they can. So I don't think they're going to let a win, uh, a game against the Wizards slip by, especially without a guy like Bradley Beal. It's, it's honestly, I would almost put money on the fact that they wouldn't win a game. I mean, almost, I don't know. If almost. Best, you know, to? Almost. No, uh, uh, almost. Because, like I said, like, if Smith could give you, like, 50 one night, who knows? <laughs> Something crazy could happen. Because, um, no, yeah. But, like I said, um, it's, it's all going to come down to – uh, next year. Yeah. All right. Well, that was our uh, questions for the uh, for the bubble. Um, anything else you guys want to add or? Uh, that's, that's good. All right. Well, that was a great pod. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.